Okay. Now, if if we aren't paying attention to the abdomen, please start paying attention to it. You need to know it to the full. Parts in anatomy where you need to concentrate the abdomen in to the full, like all, all relations, the spaces, the recesses, the ligaments which are there. If we go to the upper limb, you can look at the popliteal fossa, you can look at the, the scapula, those foramen that you form, the triangular space, quadrangular space, triangular interval, and also the nerves and the arteries, specifically how they, there will be a transition from the subclavian to axillary to brachial, at which point those are transitioning, and how they are relating to each other. So if we are saying we have got the brachial artery, the radial nerve, the axillary, and then these other nerves. How are they relating? Which one is left? Which one is right? It's important to, 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 to know that. If we come to the lower limb, we concentrate on things like the popliteal fossa, the hunter's canal. You have got the inguinal uh, triangle, the femoral triangle. These are some things to concentrate on which are high yield. In biology, you can look at from first week to fourth week, at least more in detail. And then you can touch here and there for the other weeks just to know some things. Histology, we look at the stomach. We, let's just look at the GIT, the respiratory, the urogenital, at least in detail. And then we can touch there and here. So there are some specific parts that we really need to concentrate on. Okay. So the abdomen, I'll not waste time on this. We already know this. We can divide the abdomen in two four quadrants or nine quadrants. So for four quadrants, we can use a line that is passing on the very middle, okay? A line that is passing on the very middle, which is a vertical line, and then we can use also an horizontal line, so two lines. What is important for us to know about it, we need to know something about these lines. The horizontal line, you can see is called the trans umbilical plane. That's because it's passing like on the umbilicus there. And then you have got it, okay, it passes through the umbilicus. Where now, between which vertebra are they, is that line passing? That is what is important to know also. Okay, between L3 and L4, because we know that the umbilicus is like somewhere at L3, L4. So this is where this structure is actually passing. So it is important to know that for, for, for that sake. Now, when you talk about the nine regions, we need to pay attention of these lines. So you can see we have got two horizontal lines and two vertical lines, and they have got names. So the two horizontal lines, the ones which are on top, the one which is on top is subcostal. Now we know the meaning of costal, right? It has to do with cartilage. So this one is below cartilage, that's why subcostal. And then the other one you can see there is intertubacular. So it's like it's running from the tubercle of one, of one, uh, think of the this crest the crest of the ilium on top here is just passing on top there. So from one to the next, the other side. But then what is important also to understand is where do they pass? On what levels do they pass? So the one which is superior is called the subcostal. We've already seen that. And it's going to pass uh, lower to rib number 10. Rib number 10, just below that. And then it is going to pass posteriorly what level of the vertebrae. So it is L3. So it's also important to understand that it is L3. So the subcostal is passing at L3. 
Now, this same sub cost that we are using, this one, we can use also another line instead of the sub cost. And that one is called transpyloric. Okay, the transpyloric. Now, the transpyloric, when you use the transpyloric as the upper portion, then you are, this one is going to pass at what? At L1. Okay, at L1. So, meaning that it is a bit of lower. So, if this one is the sub cost, and then you use the transpyloric, it's supposed to be not a bit or a bit high, it's supposed to be somewhere there. And we, it is called transpyloric because it is going to pass on the pyloric part of the stomach. When you draw the stomach, it's something like this. So, the pyloric end is here, it's like it passes there on the pyloric end of the stomach. That is why it is called transpyloric. So we should be able to know where the, the pyloric end of the stomach is. That is the L1. So it's important to take note of that, okay? And for anatomy, the goodness is you don't need just to be mastering there and there. You, you need to know relations. That is what is very important, relations. If you saw the questions which came in the makeup test and they were all essays, almost all the questions we are just talking about relations, right about the axillary uh, nerve, relations and innervation. So you write, when it is moving, how does it relate to structures? That is what is important. So if I know a structure, I need to know how it relates to others. Very, very important. Okay. Now the transpyloric plane, this one, it might be used and then it is going to be, uh, look at this, it's going to be halfway between the jugular notch and the pubic symphysis. And we know where the jugular notch is. The jugular notch is, what is the other name for the jugular notch? This end here. So it is on top of the manubrium just on top of the manubrium there. So we, we are going to start all the way from here, going to the pubic symphysis. Now the pubic symphysis is there. So the midway between this, that is where we're going to find the transpyloric line. Okay, so another thing to know about this is that this lower margin is going to be the ninth costal cartilage. We've already talked about that. And then the inferior horizontal line, the inferior one, just give me a moment, I accept people here. Okay. So, the inferior horizontal plane, this one is going to look at this, L4, that is where it's going to pass. This is important, L4. So the other one is passing at L1, the other one is at L4. Remember, the upper one, you can use, either use the transpyloric or the subcostal. Subcostal is L3, transpyloric is L1. So that is what we need to take note of. And then the vertical ones, the vertical ones run on the midpoint of the clavicle. So they are called midclavicular lines. So it's also important just to take note of that, midclavicular lines. Now, some surface relations that we need to know. You can see we have got the inguinal ligament here. And then on the umbilicus, we know we have got the transpyloric line there. And then we have got the anterior superior iliac spine. If we draw a line on the mid, uh, I mean, which is joining the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine, that gives us the Mac Benner's point. And the Mark Benner's point is going to be used to identify if someone has got appendicitis. So if you press there on the middle portion, now it's not really on the middle portion, that is actually not correct, not on the middle portion. So when you are moving from, and this question I think even came in test too, I, I really did come. Okay, so when you are talking about the Mark Benner's point, when you are starting from the midi point, this is the midi point here. As you are going towards the lateral, you are going towards the anterior superior iliac spine, it is the distance there is one third. I mean two thirds. So this is two thirds. Uh, this pen is not visible. 
let me try to use this one it's also not visible hope you can see that's two threads and then the end here is one thread so they can ask the mark banner's point is so it is one thread when you are moving from lateral to anterior it is going to be two threads when you are moving from anterior not even not anterior but medial so lateral to medial or medial to lateral let's take note of that point it's very it's a very important point if you check through the test too you'll be able to see it okay okay now let's go to the anterior abdominal wall a very high yield patch to know anterior abdominal the first thing we need to understand are the boundaries so the boundaries are very important some things seem so useless and one question they brought was just mention the boundaries of the gluteal region some things are very easy some things might be trick and then also mention the boundaries and the contents of the femoral triangle something just easy so it's not something to take for granted so the boundaries of the anterior abdominal we are going to start from the xiphoid process and costal ma margin we know the where the xiphoid process is this is our sternum so just at the end there you follow also the costal margins like that okay you follow the, because you have got ribs going in that direction so from the xiphoid process you follow this structure like that and then that is the superior and then if you go on the posterior you're going to have the bones the vertebral bones meaning that behind the vertebral bones that is not anterior abdominal okay and then on the inferior you are going to have uh, upper part of the pelvic bone the upper part of the pelvic bone you know how it moves something like that so that is going to be the region now what are the layers layers are very important to know here Layers are very easy. You always start with the super, superficial most, which is the skin. At the end of this, we are going to have exam questions from different past papers. I hope we are taking note of this because <laughs> almost everything we've talked about so far is there in the paper, in, in, uh, in one paper or the other. So the superficial most structure of the uh, anterior abdominal is the skin. The next is going to be the superficial fascia. The next is going to be the deep fascia and then the muscles after the muscles we are going to have transversalis fascia and then extra peritoneal fascia after extra, extra peritoneal fascia then you are going to have the parietal peritoneum we know if you move from the parietal peritoneum you are going to have visceral peritoneum and then you have got your organs inside so these are the layers it's very important to take note of them now when you look at the superficial fascia is going to have two fascias one which is fatty the fatty is the outer part and it's called campus and then the membranous part is inside that is called scampus so how do you know c comes first and then s comes later so c will be the first and the first is always fatty the membranous is always inside so campus fascia campus fascia now starting with the superficial fascia which is which can either be the campus fascia or scampus fascia. It is very interesting on this one. Okay. This this layer of fascia, the superficial fascia, is a fat layer that we know. It is a single layer which is going to be continuous with almost all the layers of the other body regions. Now, in the lower region of the anterior abdominal wall, below the umbilicus is going to form. So take note of this this is below the umbilicus that's where it's going to form the campus fascia and the scampus fascia in the front and this diagram it might even come in gross in the gross practical so you can see the first layer here is a skin the next layer is supposed to be the superficial fascia but the superficial fascia are going to have first the campus campus fascia which is the fatty okay which is the fatty there which you can see here and then the next one is going to be a membrane this is the membrane here that is the scampus and then from the superficial fascia you are going to go now to the 
you can see that you are supposed to go to the div fascia. Where is the div fascia here? Okay, let's let's go to the muscles. Now, the I want us first to follow the the order. From the skin, you go to the superficial and then deep fascia. Now I can't see the deep fascia. That's why I'm going direct to the muscles. So the muscles again, we need to know which one is going to be first, which one is going to come later. I know we know that, and we need to know about the the way the fibers are running. So the first layer is external oblique. The fibers are going down in front, down in front. And then the next layer is going to be the internal oblique. Now for the internal oblique, the, the fibers run opposite. They run up, upwards in front, upwards in front. The transversus abdominis is going to have layers which are some bit similar to the internal oblique. Uh, that is the innermost. And then you have got the fascia. So the fascia that comes immediately after the muscles is supposed to be the transversalis. So if you just see the fascia immediately after the muscles, transversalis. And then the fascia that comes after the transversalis fascia, it's extra peritoneal fascia. And then now you are going to have your visceral peritoneum, that peritoneum which is covering our viscera. Now the campus fascia, which is called, which is of course a superficial part of the superficial fascia. Hope that doesn't confuse. Superficial fascia has got the superficial part and the deep part. The superficial part is the campus. The deep part is scampus. Now we are talking about the superficial part. This one is continuous over. It is going to go over the inguinal ligament. It will, it will continue over. Now in men, this is important to take note. In men, it is going to continue over the penis, loses its fat, and is going to fuse with the deep fascia. In men, what fascia is that? That is a campus, which is fatty. So it will no longer be fatty on the penis. It becomes one with the deep fascia. And then it will also continue over the scrotum. And here it is going to be known as datos fascia. I saw a question which says the following are examples of campus fascia except. So let's be taking note of them. So one of the campus fascia we can see is datos fascia, specifically where? In the scrotum. And then in women, it is going to have some fat and it will be component of the labia majora. In men, it is over the penis. Now the scampus. The scampus fascia is a thin and membranous and it doesn't have any little or no fat. It is going to run inferiorly and it will continue also into the thigh. So just below the inguinal ligament is going to be able to fuse with the deep fascia of the thigh. The deep fascia of the thigh is known as fascia lata. This is a deep fascia. The others we've talked about are superficial fascias. Okay. Apart from that, it is also going to continue into the anterior part of the perineum, where it firmly attaches to the ischial pubic rema. Ischial pubic, when you have got the, pub the pubic bone, and then the ischial which goes behind, hope we can picture this, and then you have got like it goes, this is just one part of the bone. The other part is going to be like that side. This is supposed to be the pubic symphysis. So where the ischium and the pubis are joining, that is called the ischial pubic remi. So it's going to continue over there and it will go to the posterior margin of the perineal membrane. So in the perineum, this scampus fascia is going to be the colis fascia in the perineum. So we need to know the fascia in the perineum is the colis fascia. The, the fascia in the scrotum is datos fascia. And then the fascia in the thigh, fascia lata. And we know the fascia in the anterior abdominal and the posterior abdominal, we know them like that. So this is important to take note of. Okay. So again, in men, superficial fascia of the penis, uh, this same fascia, this same deep layer of the superficial fascia is going to blend with the superficial layer 
and they are going to pass over the penis. And they are going to form the superficial fascia of the penis before they continue into the scrotum to form the datos fascia. So you can see they are joining both of them. The, the superficial layer and the deep layer. Extension of the deep membranous layer of the superficial fascia attaches. Yes, doc. It will continue over the labia major. Okay. So, extension of the deep membranous layer of the superficial fascia is going to attach to the pubic symphysis and then it passes inferior downwards over the penis. And what is important is that this scampus fascia is going to form a ligament in men, which is called fungiform ligament of the penis. And then in women, it will still continue into the labia majora and the anterior part of the perineum. So the fungiform ligament of the penis comes from the scampus fascia. Hope we can see this representation here. So you can see we have got the superficial fascia there, the fat layer, and the membranous layer. Okay, those two. This is the inguinal ligament. You can see the inguinal ligament is a bit of uh, in the in the inside. And then as you go into the scrotum, you can see the fascia, what it becomes. In the scrotum, it becomes the datos fascia. And then here we are going to the thigh. As we go towards the thigh, what does it become? It becomes the fascia lata. In the perineum, what does it become? In the perineum? We've forgotten. We've not. So it's a colis fascia. It's important to take note of that. Remember I said that there is a question this they can ask. So here it is. So you can see. Now, something also very interesting. The external oblique muscle, as it gets to go in front, actually all the muscles as they go on the midline, they are going to form an aponeurosis, and that aponeurosis is going to be able to merge, right? It will come together, it crosses over, and it's going to form a nice structure that we are going to discuss. Now you can see we have the, the membranous uh, fascia, which is the scampus fascia here. The, 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 the campus is supposed to be much inside. Actually, the campus was supposed to be on top. This is a membranous. So that is a scampus, which is supposed to be inside. Now, one thing interesting is that when the external oblique continues to go towards the midline, it is going to form what? An aponeurosis, which is like uh, just a, how do I describe this? Something like a tendon. Okay. A, I, I've forgotten the right word to use. If I remember it, I'll use it. Just like a membrane, a membrane. Now on the on the down portion of the external oblique muscle, actually aponeurosis is going to fold in itself. It's going to fold, and that folding of the external oblique is what is going to result into the inguinal ligament. So the inguinal ligament just comes from the what external oblique aponeurosis. So you can see you have got the colis fascia continuing in the perineum. And then you have got uh, uh, fascia lata, which is of the thigh. Okay. And then also the datos fascia, which is going to the scrotum. So the, these fascias we can see here, they're supposed to be scampers. They are coming from the what? From the membranous part from the membranous part. Actually, the question I saw the, was the, the following are types of scampus fascia, except, so they mentioned colis fascia. They mentioned uh, colis, campus, fascia lata, datos. So which one of these is not scampus fascia? Colis, campus, fascia lata, datos. Which one is not scampus?
Okay, it's going to be campus. You see now, trick this. So campus is another layer. Remember, we said the campus and this campus are actually going to merge, right? When they merge, they are going to now form the datos in they'll form the data so if you are ask if the question in, is in that way then the campus is going to be disqualified because campus is not a type of scamper but these others are a type a continuation in different regions okay and then on the muscles on the muscles so you are going to have flat muscles and then you are going to have vertical muscles now the flat muscles we already talked about them the external oblique internal oblique and transversus abdominis now, the vertical muscles are only to the rectus abdominis and the pyramidalis. There's actually a question which I saw. The recommended book of the anatomy textbook says the pyramidalis is what percentage in people. So this muscle is going to be found 20% in 20% of people. It's not in everyone. And imagine that was an exam question. In what percentage of people they had put different percentages there? Okay. So almost all these layers are going to have almost the same function. One thing is that they maintain the physiologic normal, the normal physiological function to keep also abdominal viscera within the abdominal cavity to protect also viscera from injury. Imagine maybe for whatever reason you fail and then you hit yourself to protect the viscera inside. What will be hit are these layers instead of the viscera. Also maintaining the position of the viscera. It also helps in expiration. Okay. These muscles are important in expiration also. Especially when you are getting uh they are going to be able to push the viscera upwards when you get to cough and when you get to vomit like that. It might you closely as I think this one came in practical one. Ma we need to know about their innovation. External oblique is going to be innervated by anterior ramus of T7 to T12. So 7 to 12. It, we know after external what comes is internal. This one is T12. It also same T7 to T12, but we are also including L1. Transversus abdominis, also the same as it internal oblique t7 to t12 and l1 rectus abdominis is very you, so for the rectus abdominis is going to be the same as the external oblique that is t7 to t12 pyramidalis is like a small muscle it just has innervation from the anterior but this is not posterior ramus anterior ramus and you know how they like to be specific in anatomy especially if it came in the practical test Specific anterior ramus. So if you just know the layers external, internal, like how they move, external, internal, and then transversus abdominis, and then the two layers which are which are vertical, which is the rectus abdominis and pyramidalis. The first one is T12 to T7, T7 to T12. The next two have got the same T7 to L1, and then the other one will be the same as the first one, T7 to T12. The last one, the camarectus, this one is very small. And this function is just to tense the linear alba. Okay. All right. So let's talk about some associated ligaments. So on the associated ligaments, the first one we need to understand is the inguinal ligament. And we already know what forms the inguinal ligament. It's formed by external oblique aponeurosis and this is going to be on inside and then you are also this same external oblique we are going this same muscle this same uh, aponeurosis of the external oblique is going to form just inside it you are going to also have the inguinal canal something that is high yield Okay, now on the inguinal canal, this is just a thickened reinforcement, free edge of the external oblique. Like just on the external oblique, just on the end, the th just a thickened portion there. Okay, that's the inguinal canal. We need to know also the boundaries, the borders, the contents, and all those high, 
how you would like that. We also have a ligament which is called the lacuna ligament. This is an extension of the fibers or the medial end of the inguinal ligament. The inguinal ligament on the medial portion. Now, if we are saying medial portion, we are meaning near the, the midline. That is where we're going to have the lacuna ligament. So the lacuna ligament basically comes from the inguinal ligament. Okay. And then it attaches on what is known as the pecnes pubis, on the anterior mass of the pubic bone. We also have the pectineal ligament, which is also called Cooper's ligament. Now, this one is an extension of the lacuna ligament along the pectineus pubis. Uh, these are the ones we can see. You can see when this structure is moving down, down. This is the inguinal uh, ligament formed by the aponeurosis of the external oblique. On the end, on the medial end, you can see this ligament here on the mid which has attached on the pectineus pubis that is the lacuna ligament the lacuna ligament also can give an extension that is a pectinet or corpus ligament which is just an extension let's even see it here okay but one thing that we need to know is the relation here you can see the inguinal ligament is on top of these two big vessels. Now, for us to understand them well, at least we need to understand how they do start. Because, trust me, relation is very important. So you have got, let's start here. Say what I've written here is the heart. Arc of the iota. First, we're going to have the ascending iota before we can form the arc, which is the turning point. From the arc, we know we have got three structures which come out, brachiocephalic, the right common carotid, and then the left subclavian there. This one will continue down as the thoracic iota, which is the descending iota or descending thoracic iota. When it passes, when it reaches T12, it is coming out of the diaphragm on the aortic hiatus and it becomes abdominal aorta. This abdominal aorta will give a lot of branches here. We'll talk about some of them. But as we reach AO4, it is going to again bifurcate. It's going to give the common iliac arteries. Common iliac arteries also are going to break off. Internal iliac, internal iliac and external iliac. Now, the external iliac is going to be a continuation of the femoral artery. So, the femoral artery doesn't come from the external iliac, but it is a continuation of the external iliac. So, this is what you can see here. The external iliac is going to be the main supply to the lower limb. The internal iliac is going to be the main supply to the perineum and the pelvis. So, that is the one you can see. Some relation to know about it is it is be these two guys, both the femoral artery and vein, they are on the bottom, they are down, they run down to the uh, pu uh, pro to the inguinal ligament. The inguinal ligament is on top. Anatomy is easy if we understand the relations, but immediately we miss the relations, things become trick. Okay. Okay, so this is what we are saying as the pectineal or the cupus ligament, which was coming from the lacuna ligament. Lacuna ligament is just an extension on the medial aspect of the inguinal ligament. And then the lacuna ligament also gives that other ligament, which is the cupus or pectineal ligament. Now the transversalis fascia, this one, we know the transversalis fascia is going to be on the posterior part, deeper to the transversus abdominis muscle. That is one important thing that I want us to take note. It crosses the midline anterior in anterior associating with the transversalis fascia of the opposite side. So it will be able to cross the midline and then be able to associate with the transversalis fascia, which is also coming from the other side. Now, this one is going to be interesting. So, so say this is the transversalis fascia of the right side. And then this is the transversalis fascia of the left side. 
this is the midline this is the midline this is your this is where you have got you, you are going to be able to have the linear alba so these guys are going to be able to associate they'll join what is on the left and what is on the right they'll be able to join so this fascia is going to be it is going to be continuous posteriorly with a deep fascia which is covering the posterior muscles which are the thoracolumbar fascia okay after attaching to the crest of the ilium so it attaches on the iliac crest this fascia is going to blend with the fascia which is covering the muscles of the upper region of the pelvic so all the muscles in the pelvic region you know that muscles are supposed to have a fascia isn't it so all them that fascia which is covering the muscles in the pelvic region and also similar fascia is covering different muscles of the of the uh, pelvic cavity is going to come and merge with this fascia so at this point the fascia is going to be referred to as the parieto pelvic or endopelvic fascia so where the where the transversalis fascia is joining with the fascias of the pelvis it's going to be called parieto pelvic fascia or endopelvic fascia So that is it on that fascia. Now, something very interesting again, which you will see questions again. The rectal sheath, a very important thing. Now, the rectal sheath is aponeurotic, so you are just having the aponeurosis of all the muscles except the uh, the vertical muscles. All the muscles that we talked about: external oblique, internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis. These guys are going to form an aponeurosis. Okay. So a neurotic tendon sheath formed by a unique layer of the aponeurosis of all these muscles. So the rectus sheath is going to be able to cover the rectus abdominis muscle and also the pyramidalis. These are the only two muscles which are vertical. Now, it is very important to understand that the rectus sheath on the anterior side is going to cover almost the or in, it will cover the whole anterior side. But on the posterior end of this rectus abdominis is going to be a different case. We understand that. So there's a, something which is called the acute ligament. Acute ligament is the midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis. Let's see if I've got a diagram. Okay, this is a point of transition of corresponding, uh, corresponding to the beginning of the lower one fourth of the rectus abdominis muscle where all the aponeurosis is moved anteriorly. I know we might not get that directly, but let me try to draw it here. Say this is my rectus abdominis muscle. This rectus abdominis muscle is going to be covered in the rectus sheath. Now the rectus sheath is going to be made up of those Aponeurosis is from the three muscles that we've talked about. External oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis. So if I'm talking about front, so let me write this muscle like this. That's the best I can represent it. Let's say this is the front, and then this is the back. Okay, hope that makes sense. So like if you are standing, the top part is going to be the front here. This is anterior of the muscle. And then this is posterior of the muscle. So what happens is this. If you come on the anterior side, you are going to have the aponeurosis of the external oblique coming like this. This is external oblique. You are also going to have the aponeurosis of the internal oblique. Now, when the aponeurosis of the internal oblique is going, when it reaches here, it is going to split. One layer is going to go in front. And then one layer is going to go on the posterior side. And then if you are talking about now the transversus abdominis, transversus abdominis just goes on the posterior side like that. So this is what forms the, the rectal sheath. So the internal oblique is going to split into two. One layer is going to go with the external oblique, the other layer is going to go with the transversus abdominis. 
Now, this also will depend with the region where you are. So when you are talking about the front part, like say this is this is me, like this is my front, this is my abdominal region. This is the front part. If I'm looking at this, meaning that I've got the umbilical somewhere there, okay, like that. So anteriorly, when you look at the upper three, three thirds, uh, three fourths, which is the three quarters of the abdominis muscle, the abdominis muscle is on the middle here. Okay, somewhere on the middle here. So the upper three quarters. And the, you have got the upper three quarters and the lower three quarters. These are going to be different. So the upper of this muscle, let's say three quarters is up to here. So what will happen is that in front, is going to have external oblique and half of the internal oblique, just as we have showed here. Now the lower, the lower portion, okay, the lower, uh, what do we, this is a quarter, the lower quarter is going to have external oblique, internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis. We, we didn't to understand what this means. Uh, I'll come back to this again. So this is the, on the anterior aspect. Now, you know why it, we are saying, so why are we saying here you only have external oblique and then half of the internal oblique? So this layer that I've written, what I've drawn here, let me use what is give, been given here. So see how the layers are going. This is external oblique. And then this is going to be the internal oblique. This is going to be the transversus abdominis. So you can see the external oblique is going like this. And then internal oblique is going down. I mean, transversus abdominis. But for the internal oblique, it is splitting into two, right? Splitting into two. This is going to only be for the upper one-fourth. Upper, I mean upper three-quarters. Now, the lower three-quarters, the other layer, the, the other two muscles, the other two aponeuroses, can see this was external oblique. This was internal oblique. This was transversus abdominis. So instead of this one going on the posterior side, together with also half of the internal oblique, all the three have gone in front. All the three have gone in front. So there is a point of transition. So at this point, you can see that the, uh, uh, the rectus abdominis muscle is in direct contact with the, the transversalis fascia. Up, it wasn't in direct contact with the transversalis fascia. Why? Because it was covered by the rectus sheath on the posterior. So posteriorly, the rectus sheath will not cover the entire muscle. So what happens is that on the anterior, the rectus sheath will cover the entire muscle. This is anterior. But on the posterior, what will happen is that the rectus sheath will just go all the way up to just covering the upper three quarters the lower part of the muscle is going to be in direct contact with the fascia this is important to understand so that is this we can see here now a point of transition a point where you are transitioning this is only on the posterior side a point where you are transitioning where you are no longer having the rectal sheath covering the posterior that is what is called the aqueduct line the aqueduct line is a point where there is a transitioning so let me write the muscle now in this way. This is the, rect the rectus abdominis. Now we understand it well, very, very well. Okay. So for the rectus abdominis, we, uh, this is going to be uh, anterior. This is going to be posterior. Anterior is going to have uh, this layer, which is uh, the op external oblique aponeurosis. And then... It also has this layer. What is that layer? That is the half of the internal oblique aponeurosis. So I'm going to draw this above the aqueduct line and below the aqueduct line. So this is the lower one third. This is the upper, sorry, one quarter and three quarters. On the posterior side, we are also supposed to have internal oblique and the external uh, transversus abdominis. 
But as you get to go below the aquat line, these two layers are going to divert. They'll change. Instead of them being behind, they'll come in front. They'll come in front like that. So this region remains without rectus sheath. So the lower one fourth of the posterior portion, posterior, not anterior. I've taken time to explain this. So hope it is okay. Have we gotten this? Okay. So this is what you can see. You can see now on this diagram. This is a quick line here showing the, there was a transitioning of the layer of the aponeurosis. On the posterior wall, you have got the rectus sheath. When you're talking about the upper portion, but then the lower portion, you don't have the rectus sheath. Immediately you see such a layer. Immediately you see this structure like this. This is going to be direct the transversalis fascia. This is going to be the posterior wall, specifically posterior wall. Immediately you see where there's a transitioning one, a transitioning. Just know that what you're talking about is the posterior wall of the rectus sheath because the anterior wall will not have this. The anterior wall, the entire abdominis, rectus abdominis muscle is going to be covered. Okay, and then you have got the rectus abdominis muscle itself here. So anterior is going to be totally covered by the rectus sheath all the way up to down, different from the posterior side. And then you can see also a tendinous intersection. This is what forms our six pack, tendinous intersection or tendinous line there. And then you have got this line where the muscles actually coming to blend together on the left and on the right, the linear alba. And there come a small muscle here, which is just on the lower portion connecting with the, the, the rectus abdominis, that is the pyramidalis muscle, just in 20% of subjects. Okay, now the extraperitoneal fascia, remember now the layer started the skin, we went to the superficial fascia, we went to the deep fascia, we went to the muscles, and then we went to the transversalis fascia, and then extraperitoneal fascia. The extraperitoneal fascia is going to be like behind, okay? The extraperitoneal fascia is going to be behind the transversalis fascia. Now this one is going to separate the transversalis fascia from the parieto peritoneum because we know this is extraperitoneal fascia, this is transversalis fascia. After the, the extraperitoneal fascia is supposed to have parieto peritoneum. This one is going to contain varying amounts of fat. This layer not only lines abdominal wall, but also continues with similar layers of the lining of the pelvis. It is going to be abundant on the posterior abdominal wall, especially around the kidneys, where it is going to form some special fascias. If you remember our class on kidney, things like the garota fascia and those other fascias. Continuous over organs. So, in this fascia, the extraperitoneal fascia, this is where we're going to find blood vessels. Okay. And so it is going to be able to extend into mesenteries because it is in the mesenteries where you find blood vessels. See, very important. So visceral in the extraperitoneal fascia are going to be referred to as the retroperitoneal. Retroperitoneal. So if you have got any viscera that is in the extraperitoneal fascia, then it is not intraperitoneal, it's actually retroperitoneal, outside. And then the fascia toward the anterior side of the body is going to be described as the preperitoneal, which is also known as a uh, properitoneal, meaning in front. And then the one which is on the posterior side, that is called the retroperitoneal. So deep to the extraperitoneal fascia, we know that is where we're going to find our peritoneum. Now, peritoneum is going to have the parietal layer and the visceral layer. We already know that. Parieto, think of if this is a balloon, I press my hand into this balloon. What you are going to see is that this balloon is going to go like this. So I've got this part which is away from my hand which I've pressed into the balloon. That is the parieto. And then this part of 
the balloon that is just where my hand is. That is the viscera. Now, the, the peritoneal lining, the peritoneum lining, the wall is a parietal peritoneum. Peritoneum covering viscero is the visceral peritoneum. The continuous lining of the abdominal wall by the parietal peritoneum is going to form a sac. So what you are going to be able to see is this. This is going to continue like in front on the posterior like that. It forms a sac. Now this sac is closed. It's important to understand this. This should have come in test two. Okay. This sac is closed in men. But it is going to have two openings in women. Where the uterus, uterine tubes provide the passage to the outside, is it's going to be open. The closed sac in men and the semi-closed sac in women form what is known as the, the peritoneal cavity. So this is the peritoneal cavity, just formed by the layers of the peritoneum. This is what we are able to see. And see this layer on the posterior end, you are saying this is the, the extra peritoneal fascia. This is extra peritoneal fascia. It can either be retroperitoneal or preperitoneal. Preperitoneal is the same fascia on the front. And then the same fascia is going to be uh, retroperitoneal on the posterior side. We can see it is going to go like this and then cover an organ. Cover an organ like that. So if it does this, you can see that was an organ, but it went and covered an organ. This point where we are attaching that organ to the, to the this is going to be the posterior abdominal wall. That is going to be known as a mesentery. So these are known as peritoneal folds. Actually, one of the questions which came was mention all the peritoneal folds, all the mesenteries of the liver. So we need to know them. So the folding, the folding, this one you can see it is suspending a viscera. Now, something we need to take note of is this. This, this is going to be the peritoneal cavity. Organs which are referred to as intraperitoneal, they are not in the peritoneal cavity. I hope that is okay. Organs which are referred to as intraperitoneal are not inside the peritoneal cavity. They have just been covered by the peritoneum. So think of it, the same balloon I described. This is a balloon. And then I press my hand inside. And then it is like this. So my hand is there inside. This doesn't mean that my hand is inside the balloon. It's not inside. Okay. Inside is here. It is still outside. It's just that I've punched into the balloon. That is the same way with the intraperitoneal organs. So for an organ to qualify as an intraperitoneal organ, it has just been covered all around. You have got some organs, for example, say if you have got an organ, which are at this point, at this point here, at this point here, hope you can see there. Such an organ has been covered by this peritoneum, but it has just been covered on one end. So such an organ is the retroperitoneum because it's not a, the entire organ that has been covered by the peritoneum. Now what will be the innervation to the anterior abdominal wall? So you are going to have, it will be supplied, the skin of the anterior abdominal wall and the muscles. Is that a, is that a hand or maybe it was a question? It was a mistake. Okay, so the skin, muscles, and the parietal peritoneum or the anterior abdominal wall are going to be supplied by the remus, anterior remus of T7, T12, L1. So the anterior remus is going to be able to pass. I'm not audible. Is it the case with everyone else? Am I not? Am I audible or not? Okay. Okay. So, just something, please. Let's go and review a typical spinal nerve. So, what happened is that if this is our, this is our spinal cord. You are going to have 
uh, a, a branch which is coming from the posterior horn, posterior gray horn, the anterior gray horn, also the anterior gray horn. These two guys are going to merge. So I've got the ventral root and the dorsal root. This one coming from the behind is the dorsal root. This is the ventral root. These two guys are going to be able to join. They are going to now form our spinal nerve. Now this spinal nerve will give a branch that is going to go to the behind. And this branch which goes to the behind will also give a branch that goes medially and the branch that goes laterally. This other branch which is called the ventral ramus is going to continue ventrally. It goes to the anterior aspect. And then it will also give a branch which will go laterally. This lateral branch will give a branch which will go posterior and a branch which will go anterior. And then, so these are cutaneous branches. Also, this branch which is going anterior will also give a branch that is going to go also like that and also like that. So we need to know how the typical spinal nerve moves because the same way a typical spinal nerve moves is the same way arteries are going to be able to move to supply uh, some aspects of the posterior abdominal wall. So you can see I've got the anterior ramus of these spinal nerves are going to pass around the body from the posterior and to the anterior. It's starting from the posterior side, you can see how it moved and then it went to the anterior side in an inferomedial direction. So they are going downwards and medially. They are going to give out lateral cutaneous branches and they'll continue to go like that. Now we call these nerves as the uh, T12 is going to be specifically known as subcostal because it is below the cartilage of the ribs. The other ones are going to be known as intercostal. For example, T7 intercostal, T8 intercostal, T9 intercostal, T10 and T11 intercostal. But for 12, it's not between ribs, so it is known as subcostal because it's below. So nerve T7 to T9 are going to supply the region from the xiphoid process to just above the umbilicus, just above the umbilicus. And then around the umbilicus, we are going to have T10. So this is the dermatome of the umbilicus. Now this dermatome T10 is the same one which supplies also the appendix. So meaning if the appendix is paining, the pain is going to be directed towards the umbilicus. Okay, and then T11, T12, and L1 are going to supply the skin and also the structures like below the umbilicus. This, it's important to understand this. Remember the supply, the, the nerve supply innervation is from T12 to L1. If you just know T, I mean T7 to L1, if you just know T10, T10 is the middle umbilicus. Going this side up to L1 will be below the umbilicus. Going this side up to T7 is going to be above the umbilicus. So this is how these come out. If you can see, these are the nerves like that. So T12, you can see you have got all these inter intercostal nerves and the subcostal. You're also having the ideal hypogastric. Now this one is going to the area which is more below here. And then you can see on the umbilicus, we're having the dermaton T10. Now ideal uh, hypogastric. From what plexus is this one coming from? Okay, so the lumbo sacro, the lumbar plexus, because you can see it is L there. So the lumbar plexus is going to give all these branches. You can see you have got T, hypogastric, and then you have also the ilio inguino. These are just special names. But that is L1, and we know that L1 is part of the nerve supply to the anterior abdominal wall. So instead of just saying L1, we can actually use the actual name, ilio inguino. This one is going to the ilium and the inguino. This other branch is going to the ilio hypogastric. So meaning that is somewhere you can see where it's going. Now, gastric has to do the stomach. It doesn't mean that it's going to supply the stomach. It's, it's just meaning where it is coming from. We're going more to supply the ilium portion also. So the ilio hypogastric nerve and the ilio inguinal nerve have got the same nerves you can see L1 there. And one important thing, there is an exam which just came, draw and label the blood supply to the anterior abdominal wall, just like that. 
So it's very important to understand the blood supply to the anterior abdominal wall. Now the blood supply, I've tried to, to simplify it as much as possible. You are going to have the blood supply, you are going to divide it into superficial, the blood supply to the superficial portion and the deep. The deep meaning including also some, some of the things which are inside. So on the superficial, you are going to have those which are going to supply the superior part, meaning if this is, let's say this is me, this is my anterior abdominal wall. I'm talking of superficial, not inside. I'm going to have blood vessels which are supplying like my upper part, like here, upper part, and then those which are going to supply my lower part. So the one which, are, which is going to supply the superior, superior part is going to come from the internal thoracic. Now, internal thoracic is coming from, where the, do we know where the internal thoracic artery comes from? Okay, so brachiocephalic. Mm, okay. Let's agree with that, but it, let's be det let's be specific. Yes, doc. Uh huh. So it will come from the subclavian. Remember, you are starting uh, uh, ascending. This is your heart ascending aorta, arc of the aorta descending aorta. You have got the brachiocephalic. Brachiocephalic is going to give the uh, right subclavian and the right internal. I mean the right common carotid. And then you have got the left common carotid, the left subclavian. So these guys, the subclavian arteries, are the ones which will give the internal thoracic. Internal thoracic now will give a musculophrenic artery. Now you can even hear muscular and phrenic. Phrenic has to do with the diaphragm. So some muscles and the diaphragm here are going to be supplied by this structure. And this one is the superficial branch. It's coming from the internal thoracic. Okay. Very important one. Very important. Actually, I saw a question which was saying the following are branches of the internal thoracic except. So we are talking about them. So let's be knowing them. One of the branches is the musculophrenic. And then inferiorly, the inferiorly is... Pardon? The internal thoracic is coming from the subclavian. Okay, so inferiorly, inferiorly, the blood supply is going to be from the femoral artery. Let me repeat what I said. When this descending aorta continues down, when it reaches T12, it's going to pass into the, uh, the aortic hiatus at T12. Immediately it passes the aortic hiatus, it's no longer thoracic aorta, it's now abdominal aorta. When it reaches L4, it's going to break into a, uh, in common iliac arteries. So you're going to have the common iliac arteries, these two. Common iliac arteries are also going to break, they are going to divide into external iliac, which goes to the lower limb, and internal iliac, which is going to supply the perineum and also the pelvic region external iliac is going to give out some branches which are going to supply uh the the uh, the head of the femur and all those a lot of branches so there are a lot of branches that we need to know here a lot please let's look at them because they also came in the test too the branches of the external iliac and the branches of the internal iliac we need to know them now the external iliac is going to continue downward as the femoral artery this same femoral artery is going to give us branches. The branches is going to give medially is going to give a branch which is superficial. Remember, this is superficial branches. Superficial epigastric. So it's going to give a branch which is going to go like this. This one is going to be medially. And then lateral is going to give superficial circumflex iliac. So it's going to give something like this. So these are the two branches that the femoral artery is going to give, which are going to go on the post anterior abdominal wall. So remember, please, this is superficial. Epigastric, and we know epigastric just like, epi is supposed to mean, we know where the epigastric region is, right? The, just a bit above the umbilicus or um, the umbilical region. 
and then circumflex scapula. We are saying this circumflex scapula because it is rounding the scapula. Uh, sorry, circumflex, not circumflex scapula. Forgive me on that. Circumflex iliac. This is iliac. It's rounding the ilium, the light bone, which is here. Okay. And I hope we remember what was the relation. The femoral artery, remember we said these guys are passing below the inguinal ligament. Never forget about relations. Never forget about relations. Okay. And the, so these are the ones which we can see. Superior epigastric, which is coming from the internal iliac. This one is going to supply like the, the diaphragm and also some muscles on the top part there. Now, apart from these, you are also going to have the musculophrenic. No, forget about the superior epigastric. We have not talked about it. What I want to talk about is the musculophrenic. This is coming from the internal thoracic. On the down part here, you can see these uh, these arteries, the inferior epigastric. You can see the inferior epigastric is going medially, and then laterally, you are having the circumflex now forget about this also this is deep circumflex my interest is the superficial circumflex because what we're talking about were the superficial ones so it's important to understand it so let's review superficial branches supplying the anterior abdominal wall are going to be we're going to have those which are superior and those which are inferior let's name them what is the superior supply of the superficial abdominal? Now let's give the specific branch that actually does supply. Yes, musculophrenic. So if the question came, you see how interesting it was. So this is just superficial. Okay, and then let's go to the inferior. Uh -huh. Let's give the specific branches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then lateral it is there. Okay. Thank you. So remember, all these are superficial. So the ones which are down, they always have the name superficial in them. Superficial epigastric and superficial uh, circumflex iliac. Now, when you go to the deep, the deep branches, the deep supply, we're also going to have superior and inferior. Let me again draw the abdominal. But don't forget that we have now gone deep. So this is our anterior abdominal wall. But we are no longer superficial. We are deeper, a bit deep. So I'm going to talk about superior, the upper part, the superior part. The superior part, it will be again from the internal thoracic. Now it is not musculophrenic, it is superior epigastric. So the internal thoracic will give the superior epigastric. So now you see the question came the following are branches of the superior of the internal thoracic escaped. They mentioned superior epigastric, they mentioned musculophrenic. If you just find those, those are part of the answer, okay? And then you are also going to have inferiorly. Now, inferiorly, instead of the artery is coming from the femoral, so before the femoral, before the, the external iliac becomes the femoral, just as the external iliac is going to give out the inferior epigastric. Remember the one, the other one which came from the, which came from the what? from the femoral was it? superficial epigastric, right? This one, which will go medially, is coming from the external iliac, is going to be inferior, even the name, inferior epigastric. There's, not, there's no way it's superficial for this. Inferior epigastric. And then for the next, that will be laterally. On the lateral aspect, you are going to have deep, so you've seen that the deep is lateral, and it is deep as you can see. The other lateral was superficial circumflex iliac. This is a deep circumflex iliac. You're also going to have the other arteries which will just move laterally. Now these ones are subcostal arteries. 
like sub intercostal and subcostal. So 10 and 11, we call them intercostal because they are passing between the ribs like that. But the 12th one is not called subcostal. It's, it's not called intercostal because it's passing below the cartilage. So it is called subcostal. So basically, T10, T11, and T12. These are going to be the lateral innervation of the anterior abdominal wall. So this covers the entire blood supply to the anterior abdominal wall. Does this make sense? Is it good? Now, what, one thing I want us to take note, thank you very much, Doc. One thing I want us to take note is that the intercostal arteries will actually come from the posterior, they'll come from behind, and then they'll come like this and innervate the front. They'll come from behind, they'll come like this. They follow the typical spinal nerve. Okay, they actually come from the, uh, oh, these are intercostal art <laughs> they are arteries. They come from the iota on the posterior aspect. That is where these intercostal arteries are coming from, from the iota, thoracic iota. They'll go like that, they come in front. So they move together as artery, vein, and nerve. Artery, vein, and nerve, they move together. So these are the ones you can see in the in the sides here. Okay. You also need to understand where they do pass. Please go and look at a rib. Where are this if this is a rib, are they supposed to pass below or on top? Because if you have got a rib like this and then another rib like this, these are actually going to be different. So you are going to have artery nerve and vein moving like up a bit of up the rib and then the others are going to be moving down the rib and questions do come here you have got collateral branches and also the actual intercostal branches so please let's just find out on that which ones between the collateral branches and the actual intercostal branches which one are going to be able to pass on top of the rib and below the the rib i've seen questions on those for the lymphatic drainage, it will depend below the umbilicus, below the umbilicus, you are going to go inferiorly to what is called the superficial inguinal nodes. That is below the umbilicus. And then above the umbilicus, all the lymph is going to go to the axillary lymph nodes. And there are about five groups of axillary lymph nodes. And then these are superficial. Now, if you talk about deep, for the deep ones are going to follow deep arteries. So lymph is going to follow deep arteries to the parasteno nose, parasteno like parallel to the sternum. And these are going to go to the internal thoracic artery. So this is the, these are the auxiliary group of lymph nodes. This actually came in that, was it the lab test or something like that? So I've got the pectoral group, the apical group, you have got the lateral group, the central group, and the posterior. Five of them, axillary group of lymph nodes. Apical, pectoral, central, lateral. So these are the ones you can see below the umbilicus. The... Yes. Okay. So there's a question here. We know the breast can be divided into four quadrants. Which quadrant is more is more prone for to breast breast cancer? Okay. So this region here, this region here which is up on the lateral aspect is more prone to to the breast cancer but then you have also other lymph nodes which are this side for the breast so what will happen is that lymph can actually also go to these lymph nodes this side and then it will go to also the other side 
so they can relate and so you can find that it can spread but the most common region is that region for the breast cancer so you can see below the umbilicus you have got the superficial group of lymph nodes which are these superficial and then ab above the umbilicus all lymph is going to be going to the axillary group of lymph nodes and then if you go much internal much internal are going to be following big uh, uh the arteries going to the parasternal lymph nodes and then to the following the thoracic artery like that i've mentioned the word thoracic artery i was supposed to okay internal thoracic not just thoracic artery okay we'll not talk about this we'll not talk about this I just want to look at this. This is the inguinal canal. We already saw that the inguinal canal, like we had the inguinal ligament there. We are going to have the inguinal canal. It's going to have a space here. And just the external oblique, the external oblique itself is going to have two openings. So these are the two openings in the external oblique. So we have got this opening here. And this opening here, one is a superficial inguinal ring, the other one is a deep inguinal ring. So the one which is down is the deep inguinal ring, the one on top superficial. Now on the layers, it's it's going to look as though it's a superficial is actually supposed to be down. The deep is this one. So on the on the so we're going to have one here, one ring here, and then the other ring is going to be here. On the po uh, upper portion, these guys, the, the layer or the boundary is going to be of the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis, tra transversus abdominis muscle, these two muscles. Now, what these two muscles do is that they are going to be on top and then they are going to go posteriorly. They are going to merge posteriorly. Now, when they go posteriorly, they are going to make a common tendon. And that tendon is called the conjoint tendon. The other term for the conjoint tendon is the fax inguinalis. I've seen that in the questions. Let's just take note of that. So the conjoint tendon is a combination of the what? Of this same which formed the roof or the superior border of the inguinal canal. Internal oblique and transversus abdominis. When they join, they form the conjoint tendon. You also have the transversalis fascia. We already know that when we are talking about the anterior abdominal, the transversalis fascia is more behind. So that can help us to know that. And then the anterior, the anterior portion is going to be form, formed by aponeurosis. Now look, the roof is muscles. And then the anterior wall is aponeurosis. So that's why we can see mot here. Muscles. This is going to be internal oblique and transversus abdominis. And then the anterior we've got external oblique and internal oblique upon neurosis. And then for the flow, you just have ligaments. Lacuna ligaments and inguinal ligament. We know that the lacuna ligament is just on the medial part. It's actually an extension of the medial part of the inguinal ligament. And then on the posterior side, we have got T's. Like at a transversalis that t and the tendon transversalis fascia and the tendon that's a roof anterior wall flow and the posterior wall if you forget in case you you mix maybe you can remember okay moat pardon yes So always remember that the superior part, which is the roof, will always be made up of two muscles. Always remember, if you can forget the others, if you just remember the superior, I think you can remember the others. The superior is made up of internal oblique and transversus abdominis. Now, the superior muscles are going to turn, they go posteriorly. And when they go posteriorly, they form a tendon called conjoint tendon or fax inguinalis. If you can remember that the flow is easy, you know that down you're supposed to have this ligament. And then you can tell then what to remain will be anterior. 
just like that okay okay so i will not discuss and just take note of the content spermatic cord in men around ligament of the uterus in women genital branch of the genital femoral nerve in both women and men and then you also have the ilio inguinal nerve ilio inguinal nerve now the spermatic cord is going to have a lot of contents also so these are the contents of the spermatic cord and the like we really need to know them vast difference testicular artery testicular veins they've got a special name pumping form plexus of veins testicular lymph nodes also the autonomic nerves there is also the remnant of the processus vaginalis you have got the cremasteric muscle and then the artery which is supplying the ductus deferens and then the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve and then you have got the other structures which is the ileo hypogastric and ileo inguinal nerves so we can divide this into we can say arteries you are going to have veins okay just say blood vessels arteries and veins and then nerves and then other structures so for the other structure the first thing you should be able to think about is the vast difference also called ductus difference the most important structure here so you shouldn't hate it for whatsoever reason and then you are going to have other structures the remnant of the processus vaginalis okay and then you are also going to have some the nerves and other things now let's go to the arteries arteries the artery that to supply the vast difference itself artery to vast difference or artery to ductus difference the artery which is also going to the testis because the spermatic cord is actually going into the scrotum so artery to ductus different artery to the testis and then also the veins to the testis now we call them pumping pumping form plexus or veins uh, on the other you also have lymph nodes like you have got three arteries three blood vessels three nerves and then three others so on the others the other thing you're talking about are the lymph nodes but for the nerves the nerves the most important genital branch of the genital femoral ileo hypogastric ileo inguinal and also the some autonomic nerves so these are the structures okay so let's just take note of that okay let's end here let's end here oh please do check through questions special relations do check through thank you so much enjoy your evening